Okay, I'm gonna go very quickly through uh, section two beyond good and evil. Um, effectively, it, what Nietzsche's done here is it laid out a bunch of preconditions for the, the, the freedom of the spirit, right? And in general, uh, what he's treating the free spirit as is sort of a relative concept. Uh, it's we've just just seen in his treatment of freedom of the will. It's he's not talking about some some sort of absolute autonomous kind of will that's unencumbered from its culture, its circumstances, or the desires, or anything along those lines. But rather, he's talking about a spirit who is able to assert some degree of independence and mastery over its circumstances. Alright, so, I mean, this free spirit is an agent in the strongest sense, right? In the sense that they are able to, you know, assert uh, this independence, this, 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 this ability to, to sort of exist within, yet nonetheless remain, uh, you know, critical of uh, their culture, the institutions they inhabit, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, um, very quickly, right, what I'm going to do is just sort of spot check a couple of, of his assertions here. In section 32, he's laying out uh, sort of an evolution um, in terms of our moral sentiments, right? Um, it, it, generally, we like to think of sort of pre-moral human beings moving to their goal. Like it's it's it, it basically pre-moral was a privation, right? We didn't have moral sentiments or moral philosophy or understand the root of obligation, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, but now we're moral, right? It's kind of like being pre-industrial and then moving to it, the industrial model. Right? We like to think of ourselves as deindustrializing or post-industrial right now, but nonetheless, it, whatever we do in the future is going to carry the weight of that industrialization with us. Right? Now, what Nietzsche is doing is actually treating these, and these are not modes of production that we're talking about here, what these are are modes of judgment. Right? There is a pre-moral phase, right, uh, wherein he describes it this way: during the longest age of uh, human history, it, it is called prehistoric age, and actions' value or lack of value was determined by its consequences. The action itself was taken into consideration as little as its origin, right. Uh, and then he makes a weird comment about China of his day, kind of thing, but nonetheless, right. Uh, let's call this mankind's pre-moral time at this time. No one had heard of the imperative to know thyself. During the last 10,000 years, however, over the large stretches of the earth, people have little by little reached a point of determining the value of an action by its consequences, not by its uh, consequences, but by its origins. Right? Uh, taken as a whole, this was um, a great event. A considerable refinement in the perceptions and standards uh, with the unconscious influence of the, the dominance of arist aristocratic values and the belief in origin still persisting. It was a badge of a period that we designate in a narrower sense as the moral period and signals the first attempt at self-knowledge. Right? So, there's a shift. Right? That happened, that was a bad thing that happened, moving to, you know, looking at the origins of an action, right? The intentions that lie behind an action. We saw this in both Aristotle to a certain extent and more explicitly in Immanuel Kant's philosophy. But <clears throat> he moves on, right? It's, I mean, if we understand the evolution of our notions of, of obligation, our moral theory, that sort of thing is an evolution from pre-moral to moral, then just like there is a post-industrial epoch that still holds within it the seed of the industrial epoch, there should be an extra-moral epoch that um, still holds within it the seeds of the previous one. He's, he's called that a refinement. Right, what he says about that. But now human beings are again gaining a deeper self-awareness. 
shouldn't we weigh another reversal and fundamental shift in values? Might not we be standing at the threshold of a period that, to put it negatively, would first have to be described as extra moral? Is not the suspicion growing, at least among us immoralists? Right? And that's, that's, that's how he describes himself. We'll get to that in a moment. Uh, that an action's decisive value is demonstrated precisely by that part of it that is not intentional. Do we not suspect that all of an action's intentionality, everything that uh, can be seen or known about it, that it can be conscious, uh, conscious about it is still part of the surface and skin, which, like all skin, reveals something but hides even more. In short, we believe uh, that, the inten uh, that the intention is but a sign or a symptom, first of all, requiring interpretation, and furthermore, that it is a sign with so many meanings that, it, um, that as a consequence, it has almost none in its and in and of itself, we believe that morality, in its earlier sense, intention morality, was a prejudice, something um, uh, preliminary, something of um, uh, the order of astrology or alchemy, but in any event, something that must be overcome, the overcoming of morality, or even, in a certain sense, the self-overcoming um, of morality, let uh, that be. Uh, let that be the name uh, for the long clandestine uh, work that was kept in reserve for the most subtle and honest, also the most malicious people of conscience uh, today, living touchstones of the human heart. Now, I said I would say something more about this extra moral phase in relation to the moral phase, right? He's called the moral phase a refinement on the previous sort of dumb, consequence-oriented kind of morality, but nonetheless, and effectively what we've seen from the, our, our reading of On the Prejudices of Philosophers is that effectively this extra-moral phase would come pregnant with an understanding of a, one moral philosophy being, you know, really and just sort of a clandestine, to use his terminology, um, sort of way to assert our will on the world. Remember at the beginning of the class when I was harping about how you should be careful with regard to reading these theorists and you should be critical as well because these guys are trying to tell you what to do. Right? No, they're doing more than that. They're trying to tell you how you should value your actions. That is, not just how to do, how to determine what you should do. Right? You see, it's structural. Right? And to a certain extent, in our reading of Mill, um, in that last section on the ultimate sanction of the principle of utility, we found that in Mill, right, really what he's suggesting in terms of his utilitarianism is that we should turn all of the power of the institutions of learning right, and religious institutions towards the fostering of a conscience that it rests on the basis of these value presuppositions and assumptions, right? So not only should we choose to act as Mill suggests, but we should indoctrinate people to calculate how to act on the basis of the system that Bentham, Mill, and the utilitarians have laid out. It's dangerous. That's dangerous, right? It, they're not reaching into just your conscience, conscious, reflective sort of capacities, but really it's a form of indoctrination. Right? Now, what Nietzsche is suggesting is that, well, two things. One, as we overcome this moral phase and enter into what he calls an extra moral phase, we should, first off, be armed with the insight that it, most of our understanding of our own behaviors and our actions, as we saw in the four-part treatment of the, 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 the will that we consider a simple thing, uh, is not intentional, rational, 
kind of activity. I mean, think of Canton Mill. We should act only by that maxim wherein we can will it to be universal law, right? So really, every time we go to act, we should apply uh, the maxim of our actions and ask ourselves whether it's, it's even thinkable or on top of that willable as a universal law. How many of the moral actions that you engage in from your, you know, your, your disposition and the behaviors you engage in after you've gotten into a car accident or in the heat of a moment in a fight or something along those lines are really conscious or reflective? Or are these behaviors that you engage in in terms of your moral actions instinctual, drive-oriented? Do they reflect this push and pull of instincts, emotions, and drives within you. Mm -hmm. So this extra moral phase that Nietzsche is proposing that we open our minds to right, and turn our capacities as theorists on right, is armed with the understanding of our moral life, where in morally speaking, our actions are occasioned not just by rational thought, Right? Even if you're a utilitarian, right? It's at the heat of the moment, or you, you know, in in the heat of a breakup or an argument with somebody, are you saying, "Well, I should uh, calculate the greatest good for the greatest number"? No, you're in the heat of a moment, and you have instincts and drives and passions, and you're habituated in that sort of thing. And if morality rests on freedom, right? And the only way we can understand if Nietzsche is right, freedom is as a form of agency, not as rational autonomy, right? Then these calculators for determining what we should do to act are fairly useless, right? If we care about freedom, right, we should understand freedom as a form of agency, that it, it, it's sort of a power that we can wield over our environment, and more to the point, ourselves. Right? So the second thing that I want to point out about the overcoming of this moral uh, phase epoch and the, the movement to this extra moral epoch right, is that, I mean, effectively what Nietzsche is asking us to do is make room in ourselves for a new kind of responsibility. A new kind of responsibility. It's not just applying these moral calculators, which are systems. They're moral systems. But rather, uh, we have to engage in some form of complicated, deep, and honest moral psychology. That's why in earlier sections he was talking about, you know, it, it, looking at, you know, the ugly in humanity, and um, where is it when he does that? It's very early on. Um, boo -boo -boo. Uh, I. Yeah, it's when he's in section 26 when he's talking about uh, cynicism. I mean, the so called cynics, those people who simply acknowledge what is animal like common, the rule about themselves, yet still have enough spirituality and um, excitability to need to speak about themselves and their kind in front of witnesses. Something, sometimes people wallow around books as in their own mire. Right? Generally, when people speak badly about human beings, and not even wickedly, this is under page 28, um, then the lover of knowledge must pay, pay close and careful attention. Right? It generally, it, it, these moral theories lay out an ideal scenario for human beings. Right? And don't get stuck in the muck and mire of you know, the, the, the moral psychology that Nietzsche is proposing. Right? So Nietzsche is calling for an overcoming of this moral phase, and he calls it a self-overcoming of morality as well, because these propositions and presuppositions are what make us up. Right? They're what we're 
made of. All right, so where am I going next? 33, all right. Section 33 reads, there is no help for it. We must haul into court and mercil mercilessly interrogate our feelings of devotion, of sacrifice for a neighbor, the whole morality of self-renunciation, as well as the aesthetic of disinterested contemplation that we get from Kant, right? um, which the current emasculation of art is trying to use seductively enough to clear its conscience. conscience. For the sake of others, not for me, these are feelings containing so much sorcery and sugar that we must be doubly distrustful of them and ask, are these not perhaps seductions? That we like these feelings, whether, be, whether because we have them or enjoy their fruits or merely observe them as spectators furnishes no argument for them, but rather demands that we exercise caution. So let's be cautious. Right. So an expansion of this argument, effectively what we have to do is go to the heart of our moral presupposition, uh, presuppositions. Right. When we make this argument, right, it's for the sake of others, not me. Right. It's loving my neighbor, etc., etc. Right. Really, if we're honest with ourselves about our impulses, right, you see, with this involves is a, a whole what he was calling in the previous section a physiopsychology in order to engage right we've got to figure out the situation that we're in how we psychologically and physiologically react to these moral situations in order to get a clear not idealized but a clear idea of the actual situation that we find ourselves when we are agents in the world asserting our power right so it, this this is the kind of a deep critique that Nietzsche wants to engage in, and it is it, the job of this new category of philosophers that he says is on the rise. These philosophers of the future are going to, well, they're, they're going to be armed with an understanding of these prejudices and presuppositions, and in a position, not only intellectually, but dispositionally to overcome these presuppositions and prejudices, right? these value assumptions that are built right into the structure of how we consider ourselves and the world. We've got to be careful also, as the, 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 the preface pointed out to us, of the presuppositions that are in the very tools that we're using to engage with this theory. Right. It's, it's the introduction, it's the preface pointed out to you, you know, there's something uh, seductive in language. Language itself is built around thousands of years of values and value propositions, and it's built right in. There are metaphysical presuppositions that are built into language as well. All right. So, it's a hefty task for this new category of philosophers, and in section 42, Nietzsche suggests something you know, of a methodology for them. Right. It's a very short section, but it's, it's one of the more interesting sections um, in this early stage in this book. Right. It reads, a new category of philosophers is on the rise. Shall I be so bold as to christen them uh, with a name that's not without its dangers? as I define, divine them, as they allow themselves to be defined, uh, for it's part of their nature not uh, to want to remain a riddle in some respects. These philosophers of the future might rightfully, and perhaps also wrongfully, be described as experimenters. And this name, too, is only an experiment, and if you like, a temptation. It's an interesting name to actually ascribed to these kinds of philosophers, right? Because, I mean, generally the only kind of experiments that most philosophers will ever engage in are thought experiments. They don't practice. They don't uh, lay out a whole series of assumptions and test them rigorously or even 
non-rigorously. Effectively, what they do is exist wholly within the space of the mind and think through the consequences of certain presuppositions. That's, that's our gig. That's what we're kind of good at as philosophers. Now, effectively, how I read Nietzsche with regard to this passage, is supported by interpretations of, from, from the, more of his writings, right, is that philosophers, the game isn't just a rational, armchair science-y kind of game for this new category of philosophers. We no longer have the luxury of being armchair scientists. Right? What we have to do is become practitioners. Think about what Nietzsche is saying here. Think about this movement from a moral to an extra moral kind of epoch. Right? What would this involve? What was this, would this involve hauling into court and mercilessly you know, interrogating our value assumptions? Right? If we have the courage of our convictions, what we would have to do is engage in putting into practice, living and trying out our various moral theories. Right? You can picture, and I'm not saying this is the case, I don't know the man, the man was long dead before I was even a thought. Right? But nonetheless, I, I don't know Immanuel Kant, but you can picture somebody like Immanuel Kant sitting down, working all day, writing his grounding to the metaphysic of morals, and then his metaphysic of morals, and then his other smaller works in moral philosophy and that sort of thing, and then at the, at the end of the day, operating in terms of a pleasure principle. Is it necessary that a theorist put their theory into practice? Right. Does, it, does, it, does it happen? Right. I know I'm capable of making all sorts of arguments that run counter to my own convictions. I'm good at it. Right? This is one of the skills that you know classical training actually furnishes you with. Right? It's possible to engage in you know making strong arguments for positions that you don't believe in. Committing them to page actually gains you a name for having done so. But implicit in Nietzsche's argument here, and explicit in other sort of it, it, it works from Nietzsche, is the idea that theory and practice are not so radically distinct as we tend to think they are. All sorts of things about your own presuppositions and your arguments and your idealizations and whatnot right, sort of appear to you as you experiment with them. Right. Does that make sense? There are very few people that like make a concerted effort, I find, to actually have the courage of their convictions and live their ideals. Right. What Nietzsche is suggesting is that this, this new category of philosopher is precisely the people that marry theory with life. Right? Now, he continues in 43. Right? I'm pointing this out just, just so we get a decent idea of who these philosophers of the future <coughs> are they. Or, like, who are they? Are they friends of truth? He starts in 43. These approaching philosophers, probably so, for until now philosophers have loved their truths, but it's certain that they will not be dogmatists. It would surely go against their pride and also against their good taste if their truth had to be truth for everyone else, too. This has been the secret wish and ulterior mo uh, thought in all early, uh, earlier dogmatic endeavors. My judgment is my judgment. No one else has a right to it so easily as the philosophy, you know, philosopher of the future might say. Now, think through that passage in terms of the uh, argument that Roderick put forward in terms of the, the imperialistic kind of nature of earlier philosophical endeavors. Right? Uh, think about Kantian or utilitarian morality. 
right? Uh, calculating the greatest good for the greatest number. Is that good for me and my neighborhood? Or my country or even just my province or state? Right? Or is it something that stretches as a demand for practice out across the entire world? To a certain extent, mill it politically roots uh, the effects of this utilitarianism. Uh, but nonetheless, in terms of moral considerations, he does open the door in that uh, scary passage in On Liberty, wherein cultures that don't benefit from this kind of freedom, this free discussion of ideas and the kind of liberties that he's discussing as civil liberties, the best they can hope for is to be ruled over by a despot with a spirit of improvement. Right? This is early on, I want to say, page 7 of, of On Liberty, and I'm not going to look it up. Um, you, can, you can find it, right? Nonetheless, it's just after he introduces the principle of harm, and just before he actually claims that, with regard to all other moral considerations, he, he considers utility to be the ultimate guide kind of thing, right? But nonetheless, right, it's imperialistic insofar as, I mean, you, you want a clear sort of justification for colonialism, right? That, that's, that's the one right there. Kantian morality goes even a step further. If there are alien beings who are rational, the categorical imperative applies to them. If they're divine beings and they're rational, the categorical imperative and this emphatic notion of duty, right, this moral law, applies to them. Right? So, always and everywhere, insofar as there are creatures capable of morality, Kantian duty applies. That stretches itself pretty pretty far, especially from someone who started out by asking, how are these things that I believe possible? Right? How can I impose my beliefs on everybody, whether they like it or not? These new category of philosophers are not dogmatists and do not subscribe to that kind of imperialism with regard to their activist kind of practice, right? It's precisely that, it's activist practice, right? Here, let's experiment with a new way of living our lives and relating to one another as human beings. Let's try it out. If it doesn't work, it's a limited experiment, and then we can either discard it or adapt it and move on from there. Right? If metaphysics, as Nietzsche would argue, is dead, right? There's no real evidence for it, right? And as a basis for action, like largely it's mythology that we're basing our, our decision-making process on. How do we figure out what we ought to do if we're not going to try out a number of different ways of engaging and living with one another, right? And evaluate them on the basis of whether or not, again, you know, from section one, whether or not our beliefs, our judgments, or our behaviors preserve the species, cultivate the species, right? Whether or not they're healthy, right? This is all subject to a theme of health for Nietzsche, right? These new philosophers of the future are very free spirits insofar as they, 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 they find the agency and assert the liberty to experiment with living in ways that run against these prevailing sort of imposed notions of morality. Uh, they come pregnant with all of these value presuppositions and prejudices. Right. So, last section, right, um, where Nietzsche wants to uh, first off point out that these new philosophers are in fact free spirits, but he wants to distinguish these free spirits from the falsely dubbed free spirits right, um, of, of his age. Right? 
He states, page 40 in section 44, uh, the obligation to, s to dispel for both of us a stupid old prejudice and misunderstanding uh, that for too long has enshrouded the concept of free spirit like a fog. In all countries of Europe and in America now as well, there's something that's misusing the name, a very narrow, trapped, in chains sort of spirit who wants more or less the opposite of what we do by instinct and by intention. Not to mention that they're bound to be, sh uh, they're, uh, they're, uh, they are bound to be the shut windows and barred doors to these approach approaching new philosophers. These falsely dubbed free spirits belong, uh, short and sour, to the levelers. Uh, the loquacious, uh, scribbling slaves of the democratic taste and its modern ideas. They are all of them people without solitude, without their own solitude, plain, well-behaved lads whose courage and honorable uh, propriety cannot be denied. It's just that they are unfree and laughably superficial, especially in light of their basic tendency to see more or less the cause of all human misery and the failure in structures of society up to now, thus happily uh, managing to turn truth upside down. What they are trying with all their strength to achieve is the common green pasture of happiness for the herd with safety, security, comfort, ease of life for everyone, uh, their own, uh, their, sorry, their two most often recited tunes and teachings are equal rights and compassion for all suffering. And they take suffering itself to be something that must be eliminated. Now, this is going to sound strange to our ears because we're knee deep in it ourselves here, right? We're we're all of us sort of engaged in these democratic institutions that, you know, see suffering as that thing that must be opposed, must be eliminated. We saw that impassioned argument from John Stuart Mill in um, chapter two of Utilitarianism about how all of the positive evils of the world, if we apply our cultivated mind and our fellow fe feeling for um, other human beings, to the issue can be eliminated provided we become good utilitarians. Now, square this. Square, square that notion of our, you know, development of human dispositional power, right, with Nietzsche's treatment of the will. I mean, effectively, the will for Nietzsche acts like a muscle. Right? He's told us that we should stop talking about free and unfree wills right? and talk instead about strong and weak wills. How do you develop a strong will? Through using it, through encountering trials and overcoming them, right? through disposing yourself to the world in such a way that makes it not easier on you, but harder on you, not by taking the path of least resistance, but by resisting the path that enforces itself most trenchantly on you. Odd choice of words, but that's fine, right? Now, you know, what I can liken this to, right, is, I don't know, it's, it, I, I teach mostly American students, lots of people come across these videos, but nonetheless this should resonate somewhat, right? Um, it, do you remember Kennedy and his We Choose to Go to the Moon speech? There's something properly Nietzschean about it. Uh, you remember how it went? We choose to go to the moon. We choose to go to the moon and do this, that, and the other thing, not because it is easy but because it is hard. Yeah. Now, effectively, this is a disposition that runs counter to this uh, you know, free spirit morality that Nietzsche is, is arguing against. What they're trying with all their strength to achieve is the common green pasture of happiness for their herd, safety, security, comfort, ease of life for everyone. Their two most often cite, uh, recited tunes and teachings are equal rights and compassion for all suffering. Right? And they take suffering as something that has to be eliminated. Now, 
But what Nietzsche wants to argue is that, no, we can't, we can't, we cannot, if we want there to be an evolution of a noble human creature in the future, always take the path of least resistance. What happens to a muscle if it's not exercise? It atrophies. What happens to a strong person if they become lethargic? They weaken. All right? So effectively, if we want a great and noble humanity, we've got to set ourselves challenges. We have to seek out these challenges that are tended with all sorts of adversity right? in order to empower ourselves. Right? That he continues, we who are the opposite, who have opened an eye and a conscience to the question of where and how the plant human being has mo most vigorously grown tall, we are of the opinion that this has always happened under the opposite conditions. That uh, the precarious, uh, precariousness of the plant's uh, situation had first to increase enormously that its power of invention and disguise, that is, its spirit, had to become subtle and daring through long periods of pressure and discipline, that its light, uh, life will had to be intensified into an unconditional power will. Now, what I am going to do, no, it's on this side, uh -huh, is pull out from Nietzsche's Human All Too Human, an earlier passage. Um, and I'm going to pause for a moment while I find... Okay, sorry for the pause. Um, this is um, it, it from a section called Tokens of Higher and Lower Culture, which is the middle book in the middle period of the... the, the, the middle section of the middle book in the middle period of Nietzsche. Right? This is pretty well smack dab in the middle of Nietzsche here. And this passage is called the origin of genius, right? It maps quite nicely onto what he's arguing about uh, the free spiritedness of the free spirit in um, in in Beyond Good and Evil um, in section forty four. There, the origin of genius, uh, the way in which a prisoner uses his wits in um, the the search for means of escape, the most cold blooded and tedious employment of every little advantage can teach us. What instrument nature sometimes makes use of to bring about uh, or bring into existence genius? A word I would um, there, so a word I ask to be understood without any flavor of the mythological or the religious. That is, genius doesn't just it's not innate or anything along those lines. You know, it is an application of faculties to tasks, right? It takes, <clears throat> it, takes uh, it takes it and shuts it in a prison and excites in it the greatest possible desire to free itself. Or, to employ a different image, someone who has completely lost his way in a forest but strives with uncommon energy to get out of it again sometimes discovers a new path which no one knows. Uh, that is how genius, uh, geniuses come about who are uh, famed for originality. It has already been remarked that a uh, mutilation, crippling, a uh, serious deficiency in an organ offers the occasion for an uncommonly successful development of an un, uh, another organ. Take, for example, uh, blind people who can actually echolocate by going it, humans can learn to do this, right? Uh, the reason being that it has to discharge uh, not only its own function, but another as well. It is in this way one can suppose many, um, a, glittering uh, many a glittering talent have originated. Now apply these general indications to the origin of gen uh, genius to the specific case of the origin, uh, origin of the perfect free spirit. Right? Generally, it's not, it's not the coddled that overcome, that become more than what they are, which is the picture of health for Nietzsche. It's those that are presented with adversity. 
who then rise to a challenge, right? That really you know, are able to exhibit this kind of free spiritedness, right? So I don't know about you, but the first time I read Morality Beyond Good and the Evil, first off, it confused me. I have to admit, it confused me. But secondly, right, what it did is it surprised me. It surprised me. And if, if we go back to the argument about um, every moral philosophy to date has been the personal confession of its author, right, kind of unwitting memoir, and effectively, as I presented it, apologetics for beliefs that were already ready formed, right, then, I mean, this understanding of, 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 of moral philosophy sort of projectively applied to what a new and fundamentally different, more honest moral philosophy would look like, would involve us sometimes being surprised and unsettled by the judgments that come out of a real experiment in morality. Right. So, effectively, right, what Nietzsche is doing here is suggesting that the most interesting and more, most important kinds of, of, of advancements for humanity happen out of this cliché but necessity, right? where we are presented with challenges that we cannot avoid and ask to rise to them. Right. This is how any muscle is developed. Right. This is, you know, this is the key right, to, to, to developing the kind of agency that Nietzsche is discussing. Now, just in like three minutes at the conclusion here, I use Nietzsche for my research, and I'm, I'm look. My research looks at deindustrializing cities. Right. It, it looks at deindustrializing cities as uh, perhaps the, the, the possible agents of productive social change. Right? I'm looking at deindustrializing cities not because everything is hunky-dory there, but because uh, the cultures that are wrapped up in these formerly industrial centers are undergoing massive transitions. Massive transitions, the ways of life, the the systems that were in place, uh, the cultural mechanisms for solving problems are all in a situation where they are forced to change. They don't work anymore. You can't rely on the idea that you know without an education you can walk into GM just like your dad and your grandpa did and get a job and provide for your family. You can't do that. Well, in Windsor, they tore down the bloody GM plant. There are no GM jobs here anymore, right? There are precious few Ford jobs. Those are going away. And Chrysler, well, they got rid of a plant too, right? So uh, the previous sort of means that we would use to support families for generations this has been going on, right? They're gone. Now we have to figure something else out. What does it mean to be urban in that context? What does it mean to be human in that context? How do we solve our problems? How do we interact with one another? How do we make judgments about the behavior of other people, right? These are all up for grabs. And we're in a situation where history culture and circumstance have forced this kind of experimentation upon us. Uh, how can we help but develop new capacities and new invigorating kinds of human life in these contexts? That's why I find these cities so fascinating, because of what they demand of the human subject in terms of free-spiritedness, Right. And in terms of dispositional ability, and generally in terms of agency. Right. So that's what I do with Nietzsche anyway. Um, I hope you've taken something from um, this discussion. Right. Um, it's, it, 
Uh oh, I'll not test you on what I'm bringing in externally here, um, but you you are responsible for this supplementary. Check out Rick Roderick's on Truth and Lie, um, which I which I post for you as part of this. He does a really great job of introducing perspectivism. Mm -hmm reality of having to look at a situation and a problem from varying perspectives. Look at yourself in that way too. This is what self-knowledge is all about. It's not disinterested contemplation according to Nietzsche. It's just looking at yourself with many kinds of eyes and consciences. Right? Developing the capacity to engage in a variety of different experiments and activities and dispositions in the world kind of thing, right? So, anyhow, um, th that is Nietzsche. Thank you. Have a good day. It's one for each of you.